the four of us kind of fell in love with seed and started this seed stage firm we call ENIAC. And now the rest is history. We're in fund five, been doing this 12 years, have almost 200 investments, a bunch of hits, a bunch of misses, you know, getting better every day. We've got 12 people, great office here in Soho. I'm here now. So again, it's about finding humans, finding their niche in the universe. And I think if they can prove that they're onto that, to us, then that's like 70% of the conviction to back them. Welcome to Entrepreneur's Handbook Podcast, where we share inspiring startup stories with practical takeaways for you, the listener. Today's guest is Hard Meta, the founder of ENIAC Ventures. They invest in bold leaders who use code to create transformational companies. They especially focus on seed rounds, so there's early stage companies. Before becoming a venture capitalist, Nihal created five companies himself. Some of these went bankrupt and others were acquired for millions of dollars. So he's seen the full range of what can happen at a startup and he's used his experience to help many other founders. He's a strong believer in helping founders from underrepresented backgrounds and he does this through initiatives such as the 100K Pledge and through his wife's initiatives such as Girls Who Code and the Marshall Plan for Mums. It was a real pleasure to chat to Nihal today. Let's go on to the show. Welcome to Entrepreneur's Handbook, Nahal. It's a pleasure to have you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So you've been mentioned on the podcast previously by one of our other guests, Vasu, and he was your assistant who then learned a lot from you and then went on to grow his own successful business. But for the people listening today who aren't familiar with you, don't know what you've done in the past, can you tell them what made you become an entrepreneur in the first place? What got you involved in this whole world? Yeah, that's a good question. How much time do we have? We have a few hours, right, to talk about this or a few days. I'll give you the quick, quick and dirty. You know, I grew up in Iowa, actually. My folks moved from India as immigrants. And, you know, they, they came over as an engineer and, and an accountant. And Indians kind of in general and a lot of sons and daughters of immigrants only have kind of a few options, right? You can be in the Indian accent, doctor, lawyer, engineer, right? And so those were kind of your charted paths. Although I saw them start their own business growing up. And so that kind of inspired me in the back of my head that, you know, there are other paths beside these set kind of tracks. And so anyway, I went to college in Philly and studied computer science and philosophy and decided to try it on my own. And so in my dorm room senior year with my roommate, you know, we started a dot-com in 1999 because that was a thing to do. And then I guess I never looked back from there. What, what was that first company about? Where did the idea come from? Yeah, the first company was my roommate and I were DJs and we we actually played a lot. In, uh, and by the way, this is back when DJing was like, like not just pressing a button on a, on a beat match, you know, mixer. It was like, you know, queuing up like vinyl on tech 12s and, and, you know, there's some skill involved. Sorry to all those new DJs. Yeah. And so we would play parties, you know, around Philly and we started emailing our friends where we were playing or where the parties were. And then we decided it'd be less work for us to just start a website, start a com, And again, that was like the thing to do back then, just like web three is a thing right now, or mobile was a thing 10 years ago. And so that company was called phillytonight.com. And actually it ended up being my senior thesis, my co-founder and roommate senior thesis as well, and ended up cobbling together kind of 10 and 25 K checks, raised about a million bucks in the angel capital from like a hundred investors, no joke, to get this thing off the ground. But that was, you know, that was our first job. That was our first gig. And we did that right after college. I know you've made multiple startups. I think it's been at least five. Which ones do you think were impacted by those lessons from the first one, the early startups? How do they affect what you did later on with the latest startups? Yeah, you know, the, the first startup ended up turning into the second company called Urban Groove. That was a network of these Philly Tonight's all over the world. And that went bankrupt in 2001. So, you know, we're, it's not actually a dissimilar environment than right now or 2008. But 01 obviously was a shellacking of, of tech, well, of the entire economy, but specifically ad supported like tech startups that had zero revenue of which we were one. And so 
in 2001, we had a bunch of debt on our balance sheet. We had like 40 employees. We had billboards on I-95, commercials on MTV. No joke, we had the Roots do like a video for us, a beatbox video, Scratch was beatboxing, like, uh, and we put that on MTV and on the radio. So we spent a lot of money very quickly, but we had, we had debt on our balance sheet. We couldn't pay. You know, the thought was that we would go back to the market in 01 and raise more money. Nobody was investing. After the market crashed, of course, and then 9-11, of course. So we had no choice but to file for bankruptcy. And so that was like the hardest thing that I had to do in business and life. It was a very humbling, humiliating, embarrassing experience. You know, those uncles and aunties that were, we were the, the pride and joy of the Diwali party, you know, like those, you know, those tech stars, you know, were now like, oh, those kids filed for bankruptcy. Like, don't talk to them, you know? So it was like, you know, we were the kind of the laughing stock, you know, of the community. And it was really tough. It was really hard. You know, that year, I actually still fondly remember, like, packing up the office, like, putting it into a U-Haul and, like, driving to my parents' house, like, with my tail between my legs. I was like, I tried. But looking back now, you know, 20 years, that was the best experience of my life. Because uh, failing fast, failing that quickly... And basically staring failure in the face and coming out of it taught me resilience and taught me probably the most important quality of any entrepreneur, which is it's not the number of times you, you fall. It's the number of times you get up after you fall and bought the assets back out of bankruptcy. And the next startup that we used that technology with was B2B that was acquired, you know, five years later. So that was a very important lesson for me. And that was definitely my most memorable, I would say, startup experience. How did you bounce back from that? So you said you had this pressure from the community. You had to go back to living with your parents and showing, well, you didn't go down the traditional path, right? You didn't do the doctor, lawyer, dentist, whoever it was. Was there any pressure that came from you to then go into one of those careers and to abandon being an entrepreneur? Did you feel that at all? And how did you stick to your guns? And how did you decide, actually, no, I'm going to try again? Well, I think, and it's interesting because we see a lot of entrepreneurs that have this every day and we actually gravitate towards them that have this quality, which is not only the feeling of resilience, but also a big chip on their shoulder. And I think after this business went under, I had a massive chip on my shoulder, you know, to prove it to myself and maybe the community in the world that I could create a successful startup. And that was my like overwhelming motivation to work extraordinarily hard on the next cycle. And so I actually moved to San Francisco in 01. I did what I knew how to do to make money, DJ, through, through two parties a week to pay my rent. And then during the days I, I coded and I sold. And we basically started this company called Ipsh that utilized the technology that, that we innovated at Urban Group, which was just SMS across carrier, which was innovate, innovated 20 years ago. And we basically help brands and enterprises reach customers over, over text. And through slogging away over five, four or five years, we ended up selling that business to one of the largest ad holding companies, Omnicom, at the end of 05. But that was, you know, that was a really interesting journey, obviously. B2C went bankrupt, pivoted to, bought the assets back, pivoted to B2B, grew it very slowly, very organically without additional investment to an acquisition. But I think, you know, that mo the motivation was the chip on the shoulder. Was it with the same co-founder for the first few startups there? So the first startup was my roommate, VJ, who's still one of my best friends. And after the bankruptcy, he actually ended up realizing what he's really good at, which is PR and marketing. He was basically like, you know, the, the bullhorn. And I was like, you know, the coder kind of, of, of our first business. And then basically we ended up hiring a outsourced technology firm to, to help me code Philly Tonight Urban Groove. And the lead developer on that, from that firm, I got to become very close with, obviously. And so when we were starting the next company, I started it with him, this guy named Mike Jelly. And so we co-founded a company, that company, Ipsh in San Francisco. And he was still, I think, on the East Coast, but we worked virtually. And, you know, but like, what's interesting also about life and especially startups is, you know, you take people along with you, right? Like I, I firmly believe that I don't believe in coincidences. I feel like everybody that is like in your life is meant to be there for a reason. And I also feel that way about your career. 
And I think if you think about things in that manner, then you end up bringing kind of people with you and talent with you. And, you know, for better or worse, it's kind of like your built-in network that has a, a little bit of a snowball effect from one adventure to the next. Yeah, because I was going to say, it's amazing that you started with your roommate and you're able to build it and gain touch. Because you also mentioned about how much investment you got for that first company, despite not having any, like, any history, any experience, you're both students and you managed to convince that many people to invest in you. But like, as you go throughout the years, who do you think has had the biggest impact on you like as an entrepreneur in terms of the lessons you've learned from them and how they've helped you along the way? Because as we mentioned before, like you held like Vasu considerably and he said that you're a big part of what got him to where he is today. Yeah, it's a good question. I think I've had definitely a bunch of inspiring and enlightening moments and events and mentor in my career. You know, I talk about this one particular event because it's a, it's a very hot topic these days, this particular entrepreneur. And so my roommate, VJ and I, I remember we were, we went to a, a talk at Wharton, you know, an undergrad at Penn on Penn's campus. And this entrepreneur was coming to speak and he was building, he just sold this company called Zip2 to dispatch. And he basically helped like newspapers create a content management system. But on the street, on Spruce Street, he had this McLaren F1. And when he walked into the class to talk, he had this beautiful girlfriend. And VJ and I looked at each other and we're like, whatever this guy's doing, like, we want to do what he's doing. You know, we want to be like this guy. We want fast cars, hot girlfriends, you know build cool companies for hundreds of millions of dollars. So, you know, that guy's Elon Musk and he was building X.com at that time. He actually ended up joining the Philly Tonight board, which is very cool. And, you know, the rest is history, right? X merged with PayPal. He sold for 180 million. He put all his money into SpaceX, Tesla, Solar City, and now he's the richest man in the world. He's done all right. His company's yeah. done all right since then, yeah. They've, he's done all right. But that, that was a pivotal moment for me because it, it kind of, for the first time, I think in my career, it, it kind of showed that entrepreneurs like could be, you know, could be cool and like it could be a coveted, in, you know, thing to do. And like, I never saw those like very distinct kind of tracks, you know, like I was saying before as Dr. Laura engineer, like not this crazy entrepreneurial track where there's no structure. And, and so I think that was pivotal to me. And actually we go back to talk at our alma mater all the time to try to preach entrepreneurship because, you know, you got to see it to be it. And especially amongst, I think, underrepresented folks, immigrants that might not have a path to entrepreneurship or creating even gener generational wealth, et cetera. Like that's incredibly important to just provide that interface. By the way, my wife does that with a, a nonprofit she started called Girls Who Code. And so anyway, I think that that was a very pivotal moment for me. And then along the way, I think we've just been able to, to attract like incredible mentors that we learn from even, even today. You know, one of my mentors, Mike Maples is kind of this legendary investor at Floodgate, you know, early Twitter, early Twitch, you know, the list goes on and on. And, uh, you know, we just shared with him an investment we're looking at and, you know, the amount of time and effort he puts into the meeting, he didn't end up getting there. But the response and then actually sending me thoughts as well was, is just mind blowing. You know, somebody that has had so much success to, to take the time and have the humility, you know, to just provide knowledge, you know, to everybody involved from his perspective, I think is really, is, was really inspiring. So, and there's a bunch of those mentors, you know, Fred Wilson at Union Square, Bijan at Spark. Rich Wong at Excel, Mark Suster at Upfront that like I, I've looked up to kind of as a, as an investor in this part of my career over the past 12 years. But, um, but yeah, those are, again, people that you collect along your journey and kind of never lose touch with. There's a few interesting things you mentioned there, but I want to come back to what you said about initially you were motivated by being cool. And I think this is a case for many people, but they didn't necessarily admit it. So I really like that you were able to admit this is part of the motivation where you saw Elon Musk in his early days and what he was doing and that triggered you to start thinking more about like, what can you build what can you do from there but what I'd be interested to learn is what changed over time how did your motivation change because I'm assuming that's not what motivates you today I mean it's interesting actually I think if you break down a lot of human psychology like people are attracted to 
to cool things like like how do you define cool you know you know something that makes you feel kind of you know more empowered you know more comfortable more confident you know something that attracts energy and grows energy in you instead of diminishing it but i would argue you know a lot of the things that we look at and invest in you know the things that are cool to us are very unsexy to other people you know like vertical SaaS, construction technology marketplaces like that's fucking cool to us. You know, we think that's cool. And so we're attracted to that, you know, so it's a different type of cool, but, but I still think that's fairly consistent, you know, which is what humans in general gravitate to, you know, the music you listen to, the clothes that you wear, you know, the people that you follow on TikTok, etc. I guess the best question there is how has your definition of cool changed? Because Back then, it was fast cars and top girlfriends. But I guess now, I don't know what you mentioned before, but you like cycling around the city. Yeah, I mean, I mean, cool is like, you know, just met this like, you know, founder from University of Waterloo, which is like the the MIT of Canada, who is like running some secret AI lab at Apple, and he's starting a new company. And that's that's cool to me. <laughs> So yeah, the definition of cool has changed a little bit, but for me, I guess. But you know, again, it's things that 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 uh, that you're attracted to, that are accretive and energy. You know, that obviously keep changing in your life, but but you need to keep chasing. And you mentioned as well about you made the switch to the investor side. Now, what was behind that switch? What made you decide that's who we wanted to focus on? Yeah, good question. I mean, my very first angel investment. So when I sold that startup in San Francisco the SMS startup called Ipsh. A kid actually from Wharton was dropping out and he was building a mobile ad network and he saw this, the press or whatever, and he reached out and he said, can you help? And had a few calls with him. And then he said, you know, I'm raising a very small round with some family, found a first 100K, would you be interested in investing? I knew nothing about investing. So I'm like, okay, I guess, like here's some money. I got this amazing front row seat to this trajectory, which was soon thereafter, Jim Getz from Sequoia led the seed round. Soon thereafter, Rich Wong from Excel led the Series A. And the company ended up growing enormously quickly. And four years later, it was acquired by Google. That company was called AdMop. And it was probably one of the first mobile, very large mobile software exits, pure play mobile software exits. And I really got to see like VCs hard at work and very positive for the founder. You know, as a founder previous to that, I was always very skeptical of VCs. I mean, even when I hear today the term VC, I, 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 I cringe a little bit because we were trained that VCs were bad. VCs were vulture capitalists. VCs steal your company, push you out, you know, fuck up your business. And I got to see Jim Getz and Rich Wong do their thing, which was like, the founder of that company, Omar Hamoui, actually just spoke to him last week. He's also on the other side now as a VC. You know, the board knew his strengths and weaknesses. And so actually around him, they installed, you know, this incredible VP of sales, Tony Nethercutt from YouTube, this incredible CTO, Kevin Scott, who's now the CTO of Microsoft, this incredible BD sales engine that's managing tens of thousands of people at Google today, Jason Spiro. And, and there's so many other folks, right, that they ended up recruiting and really backing the founder and plugging the holes. And I got a front row seat to that all the way to the exit. And I was like, holy shit, like when this stuff works, it can really work. And that was a very positively inspiring, you know, kind of experience for me where I was continued to angel invest kind of for the next five years. And then around 2009, three of my buddies from undergrad who also had similar trajectories to mine, which was building startups, failing at startups, angel investing in startups. were like, let's, let's do this together and let's do it through a fund. And so that was kind of, you know, the genesis of Eni and the ethos of the firm is like, we wanted to disrupt venture in the sense of the things that we thought were, were crappy as founders and the things that we really liked as founders. And so now we get to do it our way and not only be founder friendly and all that kind of bullshit, but really work hard alongside founders, 
you know, in the trenches to get through product market fit, which is the stage of the business that we loved. The stage of the business that we really spent a lot of our time operating, the zero to one stage. You know, I think later on is a different skill set. We're not, you know, trained for that as founders, operators, or investors. And so we pass the baton at the Series A to the next cohort of investors, the Sequoia, Bessemer, Excel, et cetera. But we really want to focus on that zero to one. And so, you know, the four of us kind of fell in love with Seed and started this Seed Stage firm we call ENIAC. And now the rest is history. We're in Fund 5 been doing this 12 years, have almost 200 investments, a bunch of hits, a bunch of misses, you know, getting better every day. We've got 12 people, great office here in Soho. I'm here now and living the dream, you know, loving what I do with who I do it with, which honestly is a definition of success. It's really interesting because it's this idea, I think, where sometimes people want to get to the investor side, but potentially they want to get to the investor side because they see it as maybe an easier route. Whereas I often find the people who are most successful as investors are the ones who are like you're saying there, is that you really want to actually help the founders. Because actually you can make a difference, right? Anybody can put in money, but you're helping those companies succeed because of what you're doing and you're adding value to them. And especially if you believe in what that company is doing, that must be really satisfying to know that you are able to help them where maybe they would have gone off track because they didn't have the experience in certain areas. But because of your experience over the years, you're able to guide them along that right path. And you mentioned as well by getting better every day. What do you think's changed from when you were in those early days, 12 years ago to today? What do you look for that you didn't look for before? Or what do you value differently to what you did before? Well, I think, you know, when you work with a team and a partnership, you're constantly evolving. And you're constantly trying to, you know, make your team better, right? It's like any well-oiled team, whether it's, you know, I talked about the Golden State Warriors before to, you know, a venture capital, te- you know, a team of folks like in venture capital, like I think everybody wants to kind of always level up and work on their weaknesses and get better and double down on their strengths as well. So I think in a team environment, you kind of can provide that feedback to other folks and help each other get there. And so every day we're trying to get better. So like, you know, for example, you know, I've realized that kind of one of my strengths is from building these startups and accumulating kind of this network over time is, is in fact the network. And so like my team has recognized that as well. And even on our website, they call me like the human Rolodex, you know, And I pride myself on being one or two, you know, hops away from reaching anybody. And that's very helpful for our founders and for, for our team. And so, you know, how can you organize that network in a way that is extremely advantageous and, and, uh, you know, and, and useful for anything that you need. And so, for example, we created this thing called the ENIAC network that we just launched a few months ago. It's on our website, eniac.bc slash platform. And these are right now over 60 folks that we've collected in our past that we've become friends with that are experts and from the Fortune 5000 in specific areas. And these folks are basically on duty for any founder that we meet to help accelerate their businesses in and out of portfolio. So they don't even have to be an invested, you know, invested by us to have access. And so I think providing those sorts of things, like in that, in that sense, it's kind of formalizing and creating structure around this kind of network that we've aggregated is like one example of getting better every day. You know, like how do you actually kind of weaponize all of the awesome people that you've met in the past kind of two decades of working in tech? And like that was an output of 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 that exercise. Right. And so, you know, just constantly thinking about ways to, to help founders, you know, find product market fit faster. And I think high level, what it is, is, you know, I, I believe kind of, maybe this is more a philosophical belief that everybody has a unique niche in the universe, you know, that everybody has their own kind of founder market fit in the world. 
and product market fit in the world. And some people spend decades searching for it and never finding it. But like, I feel like our job is in a little ways, like helping people find that quicker, you know, as an entrepreneur and whatever you're building, it can be something, you know, like a, you know, Uber for dogs or like, I don't know, just some weird shit or like, you know, something like Uber or Airbnb or attentive or alloy companies we've been lucky to be part of. You know, I think for people to find, to be aligned with that, that niche and that passion, just fucking lock in and just create gains in that space. And as Malcolm Gladwell says, 10,000 hours later, you are the de facto expert. You know, you think about it 24 hours a day. That's just as much as Elon Musk or Bill Gates. And so you will, you are the foremost expert in that space. And that is the niche in the universe that you're carving out. And that is on your tombstone when you die and all of that. And so I think that's kind of the overarching philosophy in a sense of what we do. You know, the, the, the check writing is like 1% of our business. The rest of it is like really helping find founders find their groove. Have you got any examples of founders where you think they've like, they've got that perfect product market fit to, the, to themselves, where their skills completely align up and their ambitions and their interests, where when you got them on board, when you first talked to them, you're like, wow, this is going to be something special. Or is it, or often does it need a bit more time than that? You know, it's interesting. You had Vasu on the show earlier, right? And so he's a great example of this. He had three pivots, you know, before he hit product market fit. But what we saw in him very early was just that underdog, gritty, resilient mentality. You knew this kid. I knew this 10 years ago. He was never going to give up. We, in our industry, we call that a, a cockroach. It's not a very endearing image, but cockroaches never die. And if you can live another day, you know, to swing the bat one more time, you're going to figure it out, right? It's like leveraging time as like a real axis, you know, playing the long game. And it's not about the immediate business that this founder is creating. It's about the perceived resilience and grit and creativity and cockroach ability of this founder, you know? And that's why I saw in Vasu early. That's what we saw in Vasu early. And lo and behold, three pivots later, I think we wrote a blog post, took eight years to get to the Series A. This company's flying, you know, 10 years in. So yeah, I mean, it happens all the time, right? Uber had a bunch of pivots. Airbnb had a bunch of pivots, you know, the greatest companies in the world. You never end up with the business plan you started. But the thing that stays consistent is the team, the founding team, ideally, or most of the founding team, oftentimes co-founders leave. But like we say, we're, we bet on the jockey, not the horse, because we know the business is going to change, twist and turn, as we've experienced as founders. So it's about the team, always. So for somebody listening today who's at, at the early stages, what skills do you think they should be looking for to work out whether or not they've got that cockroach ability? How do they know like this is the right thing for them? Because obviously, especially in the early stage, a lot of people would doubt themselves. Like, can they make a success of this? Can they make their business be where they want it to be? And also, what's the other, some of the mistakes that you see founders come to you with where if they just fix those or they change their minds, mindsets in some ways, that would make a huge difference to where they end up? Yeah, I think for for us, it's about... If a founder walks in here and basically convinces us that he or she is the only human on this earth that can pull this off, then it's on. You know, of course, it needs to be a big market, interesting product, but that's kind of like an afterthought to like convince me that you are the only team to pull this off, that you have this incredibly unique experience where the dots have connected, you know, for you, where you were born, your experience growing up, something that happened in your career that was like very dramatic or pivotal to make us believe that you were thinking about this all the time and this is your life's work. And that goes a long way, right? And so again, it's about finding humans, finding their niche in the universe. And I think if they can prove that they're onto that to us, then that's like 70% of the conviction to back them. Right. The other, like I said, the afterthought is you have to go after a big market, you know, 
team, obviously I mentioned teams to be very strong, going after a big market, having an interesting product. And the big market is important because we say like when you shoot for the stars, you know, you often fuck up and, but you land on the moon. So, you know, we, we really like those, those big, big swings, but again, it's all about the founder convincing us that this is his or her life life's work. We haven't got much time left. So the last like, major question I'm going to ask you is, I know you do a lot to support people from underrepresented backgrounds in entrepreneurship. What message do you have to some of those people listening today who maybe think they're listening to this, they want to become entrepreneurs, they want to build their own businesses, but they don't yet believe in themselves. What message do you have to those people who, like to help them take their next step and to actually do what they dream about? Yeah, a couple of things. One is fail fast. You know, I was very lucky to have had that experience. I say fail fast, but not on our dime, like fail fast first, and then we can invest in you after. But in failing, you will learn so many things. And just going out there and building something might not be the business that is going to, you know, make it for you, but hopefully it isn't, you know, because the amount of learning you learn from failure is much more significant than from a success. And then the specifically that experience of getting up after you fail and fall down is also pivotal to building a really important business. So I would say fail fast. doesn't fucking matter what you're building. Just go and do it and fail at it. And by the way, the next business, whether you like it or not, know it or not, you will be significantly better. You'll be able to see around corners. You'll have the muscle memory and the scar tissue to subconsciously avoid the same mistakes and by the way, now you have a network and you have, you know, a, a little bit of a brand and a reputation and you can do it significantly better the next time around. So fail fast is what I would say. And then look out for mentors, you know, around you. I mean, a lot of mentors don't even know that they're, they're mentors mentoring you. You can have mentors from afar, but like, you know, pick a few folks. And the nice thing about the world today is so flat. You can reach out to anybody on Twitter and most people respond. I always do. Uh, I'm just at Nahal Metham, by the way. So feel free to always, anytime ping me and happy to chat, you know, and, and jam on problems that you have or ideas that you might have. But yeah, we spend most of our time, I think, doing that. We love to meet entrepreneurs as early as we can, even if it might be years until they're raising a seed round that we might have an opportunity to invest. So yeah, two words for all the entrepreneurs out there. Which is fail fast. You and your wife have done so much for people from underrepresented backgrounds as well. So there's obviously Girls Who Code. There's also your Deep Brain Crypto. There's all these different initiatives you've got. So if somebody wants to learn more about what you're up to and also what any adventures is up to, where should they go to? Yeah, I think, you know, my Twitter is probably the best place. You'll get the pulse of everything going on every day, probably too much. But I think that's a good place to start. Like you mentioned, there's a lot of different initiatives. My wife found a girl who coach. She's working on something called Marshall Plan for Moms. Right now, you can follow her at Rush Mr. Johnny. She's an inspiration not only to me, but to so many other people. And we have a weekly podcast every Thursday called Deep Growing Crypto. You can find that on Spotify. And we have a run club in New York for all your New Yorkers. We run on the West Side Highway. It's called Pitch and Run. And we have entrepreneurs that, you know, pre-idea that just jump on a very slow run with us and we just jam. And so that's kind of like our open office hours, you know, for anybody that wants some exercise at the same time. And so those are some of the initiatives that we put out to the community and also just, you know, DM me or, or at mention me on Twitter and, and we'd love to chat. Perfect. It's been a pleasure to have you today in Hull. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. This has been great. Really appreciate it. Peace. Peace.